Thank you for the introduction, <clears throat> and thank you for uh, inviting me to give this talk. <clears throat> so, um, can I see some hands? Who of you <clears throat> is familiar with doing diffusion MRI analysis? Great. Okay, the majority. Um, <clears throat> so, today we're going to talk about how you identify and correct uh, physiological and systematic artifacts, and I actually want to start <clears throat> with how a typical day in my case, looks like. Okay, so <clears throat> this is me. Okay, I'm the physicist. I'm the nerd in the lab, if you want. And here's the rich and handsome Dr. Bob. And he steps into my office and he says, Hey, Alex, I've been collecting advanced DTI data. Can you help me with the analysis? <clears throat> and obviously the little star says, like, well, can you do the analysis for me? Which is fine. You know, every man, person has their own you know, skill set. And so we're there to facilitate them, right? I work in a medical facility. And so when he says, like, wow, advanced DTI data, I'm, I'm already thinking, like, wow, high quality, you know, HEP quality kind of data. And, then, and in practice, <clears throat> he shows me one data set. I'm getting really sad, as you can see. Um, and then he's even bragging about, well, I collected 300 data sets. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, so it's a bit depressing. <clears throat> and so... The point I want to make is if you look at an entire diffusion MRI pipeline, well, we acquire our data and people start using some model, let's say DTI, do some analysis approach like tractography to get your statistical inferences. Well, it's this step which is typically neglected, right? They acquire data and bam, they start analyzing. But that's kind of not really what you should do. You should look at your data quality first, right? <clears throat> and so I asked... 18 different centers across the world to send me their typical data sets. And you all know what that means, right? Their typical data sets, probably their best quality data set they've ever acquired, just not to lose face. But, but look at this. I mean, what is this? Is that human? <laughs> I was like, what is that, a pineapple? I mean, <clears throat> so I was a bit uh, amazed by the diversity in, in quality. And so let, let's go over a few of them. So let's start with this one, okay? So let's focus on this one, let's zoom in. Um, just shout, I mean, this is a small room, we can make it interactive. So shout if you spot something abnormal. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So the, the color convention is typically green front to back, red left right, blue up down. And I was actually amazed to see that, you know, it was actually quite silent and I was like, ah. Oh, do I see any artifact? But you were not focusing on the color. So if you focus now on the correct one, well, it's a huge difference, right? So <clears throat> the convention was not conventional. I mean, the convention of the color encoding was not normally, right? So here you can see some pyramidal pathways, corticospinal tracts going, you know, obviously up, down, but colored in green. So that's green is front to back. Is that wrong? Well, now it's a convention, right? At some point, people decided, well, let's do red, left, right. So it's not wrong per se. However, if you were to look at the actual orientations of your first eigenvector, so the dominant orientation from uh, the diffusion tensor, <clears throat> then even when you do have the correct color encoding, it can still be wrong. So this is correct, but this is wrong. I mean, that happens, and especially in a, in a context of a multi-center study, you know, different software packages, different conventions of on coordinate systems, then things can get complicated quite easily. And some, some of these artifacts, they, they do creep in. Right? So you have to keep in mind, with diffusion MRI, you're looking basically at two coordinate systems. We've got our spatial coordinate system, right? the way our head is positioned in the scanner. But if you're doing an eigenvalue decomposition to get information about the ellipsoid, like the shape and the orientation, then <clears throat> that information is also in its own coordinate system. That's basically what a principal component analysis and an eigenvalue decomposition is all about. You're changing your coordinate system such that the variance is minimized or, you know, or maximized along the axis, along your new coordinate system. Okay, so keep that in mind. Because if you don't, you get a very exciting Dr. Bob coming up to me saying like, hey, Alex, look at this tractography. Wow. Look, no single bundles. Oh, we should write to science. You know, we've got this unique subject. And I'm like, wow, yeah, indeed. Look at the, look at the, uh, here, the Unsen fasciculus. It's reversed. Look at this. And uh, even the corticospinal tract, you know, it's cut. Like the patient should not move anymore. But look at this. It's still moving. 
And uh, another one which is co convenient, like, hey, can he actually speak? Oh, there's no speech network here. Like, where's the arcade fasciculus? Uh, you know? So indeed, you think like, wow. But then it's like, okay, let's have a look at the data. And then if you correct for it, well, it looks a bit more what you expect. You see some single bundles. You see a lot more dense network what you expect. Okay? So luckily, there are tools now, tools now, tools available now that uh, can do this uh, automatically. Uh, there's one over here that basically just automatically checks like, okay, is this correct or not? Boom. So from a QA point of view, like Joe emphasized, it's important to put that in your pipeline to make sure like, okay, you're not making any errors there. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, another one. Okay, so again, if you notice something peculiar, just give a shout. It's, it's maybe a bit more complicated indeed, but uh, <clears throat> if you're more familiar, you see something blue over here near the corpus callosum, and like, ah, just doesn't look that clear. Well, <clears throat> in this case, if we actually were to make a quick movie loop of the raw data, and this is, you know, 60 slices, uh, 60 directions, so you're looking at thousands of images, but you can look at them within 10 seconds, right? Just making a quick move loop. And here you can already establish that, hey, there was a severe subject motion, right? In this case, the patient, well, it wasn't the patient, it was a healthy volunteer, but she was not informed to lie still in the scanner. Well, that's problematic with MRI, right? So you feel like, you know, doing the whole shebang, and that's problematic, right? Uh, do we need to throw away that data set? No, we can correct for that, and I'll come back to that later. <clears throat> But it's not just the, you know, the movie loop. It's also looking at your data from different access views. And by that, I mean if you acquire your data axially, then if you look at it coronally or sagittally, your brain is optimized for discontinuities. And obviously, you know, if you go through this data set axially, you probably all spotted this kind of signal dropout, right? The entire slice would be gone. But did you notice this hyper-intense band of signal over here, right? I mean... When you look at it, you see it, but you need to look at it, right? And if you do it axially, going down, like, you know, axial slice by slice, your brain automatically adapts the dynamic range in which you're looking for artifacts. You will never spot it, right? Especially because it's asymmetric as well. Like, it's, it's more over here. Here, it's, I guess, okay. But this was a systematic artifact that was not captured in the entire cohort, so that's kind of painful. So anyway, the take-home message here is that if you're doing, if you're embarking on a diffusion study, just do a good, you know, you know, pilot study of five subjects or something like that. It doesn't take too much time, but really, you know, hammer deep into the QA. And there's more to come, right? But this is just important. Look at your data from different views, not just the image plane in which your data was acquired. Okay, moving on to this one. <clears throat> Again, um, even less obvious what the artifact is. Um, so I asked a few diffusion experts, like, what's the artifact? And they said, well, I can't really say. Well, <clears throat> I have to say something about PIS here. I know I should have chosen the acronym more diplomatically, but the point I want to make is we don't want PIS in our data, okay? <laughs> and so PIS stands for Physically Implausible Signals. And so not, not a lot of equations. This is the only one. If you look at diffusion, our diffusion-weighted signal is always an attenuated version of our non-diffusion weighted signal, right? Because we have some B value, some diffusion weighting that we apply. And E to the minus BD is always something which is smaller than one. So by that rationale, our diffusion weighted signal is always lower than our non-diffusion weighted signal, right? I mean, this phase dispersion, diffusion, so signal is low. That's what we expect. However, we do find areas in the brain where our diffusion-weighted signal is larger than the corresponding non-diffusion-weighted signal. And to me, that's physically implausible, right? So that signal is called PIS. Okay, let's go back to this one and overlay PIS on an FA map. Okay, so I'm just flagging regions where there was a non-diffusion-weighted signal that was lower than a diffusion-weighted signal. Okay, so if you know that, let's look at the data then, like the raw data. And let's focus on these voxels four voxels for simplicity, okay? <clears throat> so here on a non-diffusion weighted signal, you can see these the same four voxels and they're indeed very dark, right? And it seems to be like near CSF regions that you see these kind of dark voxels. So what is that? What is that artifact? Well, the artifact is named after this guy. Okay, does anybody know who he is? No? Well, it's... It's an old guy, as you can see from the picture, but, well, he doesn't live anymore, but his name is Mr. Gibbs, 
And everybody knows about Gibbs rimming, if, rim, not rimming, sorry, <laughs> ringing. Um, and so just to, to get you all on board, Gibbs ringing is basically a, a concept that if you have insufficient high bandwidth data, like you know, high frequency component, then you get this undershoot and overshoot when you're doing like a Fourier transform, the inverse uh, Fourier transform. Um, <clears throat> by the way, a kind of interesting note, Gibbs, Einstein called him the smartest guy he ever met. So, you know, must be a really smart guy. Anyways, so let's focus again on the data, okay? So um, <clears throat> now I'm showing you the color encoded FA map uh, alongside with the FA map, but then flagged with piss on it. And as you can appreciate now, indeed you see this you know, rim, dark rim due to Gibbs ringing. So any interface in your data where you have a you know, kind of transition from a low signal to a very high signal, it means from a, in a signal space, it's very steep going up, right? And so just before going up, you have this rippling going down, and then the overshoot in the CSF, right? So that's how you kind of have to visualize this. And then indeed, if you look back now, and you see where we have PIS, and in the corresponding regions, we see these kind of hyper-intense FA values, then you know like, ah, these estimates are not that good. I'm starting to feel uncomfortable by saying so many times piss in my talk, but uh, you know we're not in America, so okay. <laughs> so anyway, here's a few uh, examples where I'm going to show you uh, where you can find them. So obviously, if you have a like, let's say, people with a lot of atrophy, meaning there's a lot of CSF, a lot of high intensity values higher up in the brain, then you can clearly see that in the white matter, or even even in the gray matter, you see these ripples going on, right? Um, so I'm going to show you a few before and afters because, you know, once we've identified the artifact, we can also do something about it. And by the way, you, you'll be surprised, you know, knowing now of this piss map and this Gibbs ringing, look at your own data. It's very likely that you'll bump into this, uh, this artifact. So, anyway, so this is before correcting. Um, I'll just show you after correcting first before I explain how I do it. So before, after. So as you can appreciate, after these kind of speckles, they go away, right? And I'm not, well, I'm minimizing the effect of smoothing across boundaries, right? So you could argue, well, we, we solve Gibbs ringing by just smoothing. And yeah, you can do that. But obviously smoothing, it's kind of 1980s. You kind of blur the image. Your, you know, your, let's say your resolution goes down, like effective resolution. So you don't want to do that. So we use um, an off-the-shelf total variation filtering. It's kind of a fancy nonlinear filtering approach. Um, but that approach was also, you know, already existing in the 90s, right? So we didn't do anything new in terms of the methods development. We just found an easy way to fix it. And there's now more approaches how to deal with uh, Gibbs ringing. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This one over here. Anything abnormal that you can see? Well, it might be difficult, but <clears throat> remember the color encoding. Red means left, right. Bright in the image means high FA, means a high structural coherent uh, tissue organization that underlies the diffusion. Well, if you look at the bottom of the brain over here, we see this kind of red blob. And this is suggesting that there's a direct connection between the occipital poles. Well, it's very unlikely, but you never know, right? So how, how can I actually assess that this is an artifact and not something genuine hyperplasticity uh, thing, right? So to do that, <clears throat> you can look at the residuals from the model estimation. So what do I mean with that? I'll just give you a toy example. Let's assume I've got these points, uh, X, Y, and these are my measurements, the yellow dots. And now let's assume we've got a model. And our model that tries to capture this relationship is a line, right? the simplest of simplest of models. We've got something that basically provides um, an estimate given some X. right? And the coefficients a and b, so the slope and the offset, these are our unknowns. Right? So our model is characterized by two unknowns, the slope and the offset. Okay, so the residual now <clears throat> is basically these little white lines, meaning I'm looking at the difference between what I measured, the yellow dots, and what my model, the red line, predicts. Okay, so that's a residual. And we can do exactly the same with DTI. Right? Think of it, DTI is a model. Keep in mind, we're measuring diffusion-weighted imaging data, but we're applying a model to those data, and then we call it DTI. 
right? So when you say, like, I acquired DTI data, well, I know what you mean, but you actually acquired DWI data and use DTI as a model, because nowadays there's hundreds of models, okay? So in this case, the model is DTI, same as a slope, and the, and the little white lines from the previous, you know, toy example are basically the differences between the diffusion-weighted measurements and the diffusion-weighted signal as predicted by the diffusion tensor that we've estimated from our data, right? So the diffusion tensor is basically these six components. Think of the A and the B of the slope and the offset in the line model. So once you've estimated those, you can recompute what the diffusion-weighted signal should have been, subtract it from the measurements, right, the measured diffusion-weighted signals, and then you get this map. You can average them across all the diffusion-weighted orientations to be more sensitive to the map, and you'll end up with something like this. So <clears throat> the way I see this, this is a, a good quality example. You may argue, well, it's noisy. Well, we always have noise in our data, right? You know, if you want less noise, take bigger voxels, right? But then you'll you know, trade off resolution, right? So trade is the name of the game in MRI. So you can have high quality data, albeit noisy. Um, the point I want to make here is that the residual map looks uniform, meaning everything which is left is basically the noise. So the residual map is now presenting you kind of everything which is kind of left over, which is in this case just the noise, assuming you've got good quality data. So let's go back to this guy, where we have this kind of blob here. So how would the residual map look like? Well, there you go. You see this kind of light bulb effect. You clearly see an area here where it's quite high. So in this case, it was a vibration artifact causing this kind of pseudo high anisotropic region showing left-right connections. To correct for that, I'll refer to a nice paper from a FEMRIP lab by Carla Miller, um, basically including a covariate to take into account this vibration artifact. Here's another one. And again, if you look at the data now, you, you, you can't even see the artifact. Right? It's like the Gibbs ringing one. If you, I mean, if you know it, you can go back and look at the PIS map and stuff. But here, <clears throat> you can hardly see it. Looking at the residual map, you can clearly see that there was this kind of ghost artifact, right? It's fold over. So this is the fat and in the neck. And if you don't apply enough, of, uh, enough fat suppression, you'll get this kind of rim in the data. And actually, looking back, you may argue, well, I do see a bit of dark band over here, but that's self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You couldn't spot that beforehand, really. And uh, a final example showing the residual map and what it can do is, well, I'm actually showing you the residual map now, and if I ask you, wh you know, what's the artifact, oh, there's actually no artifact in the data. And then you're like, what? what have you been telling me now? You know, in residual map artifacts? Well, there's a flip side to the coin, meaning on the one hand, residuals say something how well your you know, model predicts your data, right? So if you have a data artifact, then your model is not going to give you, a, you know, a small result. It'll be big, sure. You'll get an artifact. However, what about the model? Maybe the model is wrong, right? So this would be the analogy. If you have this set of yellow measurements, then yes, this green line is probably a good model to describe the relationship. A sinusoid would not be a good model, right? So in this case, with the bad model, the sinusoid, you'll get a lot of large residuals, right? So looking back at this image, the data was perfect, no artifacts, but it was acquired with a very high B value. And <clears throat> in diffusion MRI, if you acquire data with higher B values, you will start to not probe the hindered diffusion regime, but the restricted diffusion regime, meaning that your Gaussian assumption that underlies DTI will not be valid anymore. So in these regions, there was a lot of restricted diffusion. So the diffusion tensor was not coping with the behavior that the data was shown. Does that make sense? So, <clears throat> so on the one hand, residuals say something about data quality assuming your model is right, but if you're violating your model assumptions and the data is good, it'll also indicate regions where you know, your model was not good. And going back to this one, these are regions with crossing fibers. And you may have heard of crossing fibers. It's basically indicating that you have, within a voxel, multiple fiber populations. So that's something that you cannot capture with a diffusion tensor, which is only limited to showing one dominant orientation of diffusion. Okay? So anyway, it's kind of a convenient way to look at either data quality or model quality. And just to drive this point home, <clears throat> um, I think most of you know Russ Poldrack, a famous, uh, famous neuroscientist in uh, 
Stanford, and he scanned his own brain for a year or even longer. Maybe he's still doing it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> probably, knowing him. Anyway, uh, at some point he asked me to, to analyze his diffusion data, and so I looked at the data, and I saw this kind of uh, green patch in the middle over here. And so I was like, oh, is that an artifact in the data? No, it can't be, right? Good quality data, you know, good QA. And so I, uh, I looked at the residual map, right? That's the first thing I do. Is it an artifact? So if I were to look at this region in a residual map, I would expect to see structure in my residual map highlighting this area. But I couldn't, right? Okay? I checked, you know, which P values, and I took the B1000 value regime for being within DTI limits, etc. So I was like, huh? This is genuine, right? And so, you know, I told him, like, hey, do you, are you aware that you've got a special brain? You know? Um, so, <clears throat> so, yeah, he has got this kind of what we would call maybe a hyperplasticity or a, an unusual configuration of anterior posterior pathways smack in the middle of the corpus callosum. By the way, this is not like partial voluming with like the fornix below or single bundle above. No, this is middle of the corpus callosum. So anyway, take home message, QA of diffusion, and this is mainly at the stage of looking at your data and looking at the residuals. And both are kind of qualitative, but you can further standardize this. Um, but it's very important to do it, especially if you're embarking on, an, on a new study. Make sure you do a, a few pilots. Okay, <clears throat> and then I want to continue with a, a few uh, pre-processing steps. And let me start with a confession. A confession by a famous diffusion MRI scientist. Okay, can, can you put uh, the audio on, please? Sir, in the back, have you got the audio on? Yeah, okay, let's try that again. Okay. It's on. Oh, the poor thing, poor thing. So obviously this scientist uh, likes to remain anonymous, so if you know who is, <laughs> do not spread the word. So <clears throat> the point I want to make here is that there's many processing steps involved, many questions that you need to answer, and it's like in modeling, right? You've got all these different diffusion models, and you need to be aware of the assumptions, and you need to be happy with some assumptions that may be valid in your application, right? And so there's many tools out there, many processing steps that you can do. And I'll go over a few of them. And the first one is correcting for signal drift. And I'm thinking that you know, this crowd is very fMRI infused, so you know about signal drift in fMRI data. Well, in diffusion MRI data, it has been neglected for years and years. People didn't notice why. Because when you acquire data, typically you acquire, you know, in the beginning it was maybe one or two non-diffusion weighted images and then a bunch of diffusion-weighted images which had different orientations, meaning different contrasts, so you could not really spot the drift in the data. But nowadays, we acquire multiple B0 images, also interleaved between all the other diffusion-weighted images, meaning that if you were to plot them, just visually, you can visually see that, well, you know, it's not maybe clear to see on the screen, but 
the intensity goes down, and it's because your scanners are not perfect. They've got character, right? They they heat up, and they get mad, and brr, and then signal goes down, and up, and down. So, um, and with the diffusion weighted signal, that's also the case, but it's less apparent. Okay. So if I just take the average signal intensity of the non-diffusion weighted images, you'll get something like this over time, right? And this is an example where the gradient was really pushed to the limit in terms of uh, you know the specs that were, in, were, were you know given. So this is maybe 10% signal drift, but you know in practice you know, well, you know three, four, five percent occurs in data, right? Um, so this is the non-diffusion weighted signal, the little diamonds you see uh, you know like three apparent rows. These are three different B values. So the top row would be like the diffusion weighted signal for a B value of 1,000 where indeed visually you can also also appreciate that it's actually going down a bit, less apparent with B2000, B3000, but it's still there. And so to correct for that, and that's trivial, and that, that's what fMRI people have been doing for a long time, is you know, put it in the model, right? Well, in this case with diffusion MRI, you basically fit a low-order polynomial to your you know, non-diffusion-weighted signal, and once you have this trend, you can detrend it. Right? It's quite simple. Um, if you've got like legacy data with only one B0 image, you can also apply this technique on the B1000 images. Or if you have a higher B value, you know, up to 2000, it's still okay. If you go higher, then obviously, if you, if you remember, higher B values means lower signal. You might be dropping towards the noise floors. So what you end up with is just noise, and then you don't see the drift anymore. Right? But up to a you know, B value, to even 2000, it, it's fine. Okay, so how does it affect your data? Well, this is before, this is after. I'll quickly toggle between them so hopefully you can see a difference. Uh, if you don't, well, I'll just show you the difference map and you know, show you the percentage difference. And to our amazement, even the vast majority is above the typical effect size that you see in, um, you know, in diffusion MRI studies, right? So this is something to be aware of as well. But the good news is you can't you know, really do anything wrong correcting for it if there's no artifact because it's just an offset. Then there's uh, correcting for subject motion. This is our subject again that was not informed to lie still in the scanner. Well, we can correct for that easily by using registration-based tools, image registration to correct for that. Uh, one thing which is different compared to fMRI data is that, well, our data now contains orientation-dependent data. So if you lie in the scanner differently, due to subject motion, well, if you then correct for it, you should also correct the orientation aspect. And the toy example that kind of explains this is that if I need to reorient this subject over here, I can do it and get this. But now the orientation information needs to be reoriented as well. And that's what we mean with rotate the B matrix, because that captures information about the orientation information there. And simultaneously, we correct for eddy currents. I once made the mistake to tell a healthy volunteer, like, oh, look, and here's your brain stretching and you know, compressing due to eddy currents. He's like, oh, my God, MRI can't be safe, right? I'm like, no, 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 sorry. I mean, the data. It's the data of your brain. You know? It's not your brain that is stretching. Um, so anyway, if you don't correct for it, you get the bright rims. If you do correct for it, they're gone. So that's your telltale sign, like, okay, things are going the right way. And you can further evaluate it with the residual maps because they also will hide, highlight these rims uh, of high residuals. And then there's the EPI deformations, another one. This is also related to geometric you know, fidelity issues. So let's assume that this T1-weighted image has a high geometric fidelity and you were to rigidly align your diffusion data to your T1 and overlay them like this, then you can see that, hey, here in the corpus callosum, the diffusion data seems to be stretched to the front, while the back is kind of okay. So if I overlay the edge information of the FA in red on top of the T1, the back looks fine, but the front looks you know, kind of weird. And uh, that's because it's highly nonlinear, right? So you can't really deal with that from an affine or rigid point of view. You need you know, more elastic registration approaches to do that. Um, so I'm just going to show you again before and after. So this is without correction. So this is rigidly aligned. And this is aligned properly with, with the EPI deformation. And then people say, like, well, you know, you're showing a region uh, in the orbital frontal cortex. It's renowned for these kind of artifacts. Higher up in the cortex, we don't see it. Well, if you go higher up in the cortex, you may say, like, well, it's good alignment, but it can be better. So this is before, this is after. Okay, so definitely an improvement. And the trick to doing this with an image registration based approach is basically you can constrain the bleep out of it by just 
looking at what are my degrees of freedom of the deformation. And in this case, it's along the phase encode orientation, right? So, <clears throat> so what you can do then is say, like, okay, let's constrain all these degrees of freedom for unwarping the, the deformation in that image plane. And so if I now show it from a sagittal point of view, you'll understand this. This is before correction, after. Okay? So you can appreciate that the deformation is only in the front-back orientation, right? And so that makes it kind of easier to come up with the global optimum for alignment. Okay, and then there's a lot of nice work from uh, the uh, FSL people. Uh, Jesper Anderson is pioneering this. Uh, basically integrating both subject motion, eddy currents, EPI distortion, and even doing this all on the fly while correcting for uh, diffusion uh, motion artifacts. So a lot of improvement in, uh, in recent years there. And finally, I would like to say something about the diffusion model estimation approaches. Well, again, look at the residuals. In this case, you would say, like, okay, good quality data, but what if you have an outlier due to subject motion or pulsation artifacts? Well, in this case, from a statistical point of view, it's kind of trivial, right? It's an outlier. We have many tools to do that. We look at the interquartile range, look how many times it's beyond this confidence interval, and then say, like, okay, it's an outlier. Sure. If you don't do that, then your ordinary linearly square, which is typically what most packages use or what the scanner console provides you, it'll be biased towards the outlier, and you'll get a poor estimate. However, when you do take care of the outlier, you identify it, get rid of it, and then estimate your model with the remaining points, we'll call it robust estimation, you can get quite decent results, right? And in the olden days, it just took too long to compute, right? It was like tenfold or even longer compared to an ordinary linearly square. So nobody did it because, you know, a doctor, you know, probably will wait for three minutes because he can get a cup of coffee, comes back, and it's done. But longer, it's not usable, right? So a lot of effort has been uh, put into optimizing uh, speed, and, uh, and now it's kind of routine to use it. So here was an old case. This is what the scanner console provided. It was a child with a lesion, moving a lot, a lot of artifacts. Obviously, I kind of cherry-picked my axial slice over here, but if I then correct it, instead of using an ordinary linear square, but with a robust estimator, I'll get this, right? So hopefully you can appreciate that this one looks a lot better than this one, okay? Okay, finally, I wanna thank my collaborators. Uh, many people have contributed and, uh, to this work. I also wanna emphasize that, you know, the tools that I've shown in this talk are with Explore DTI, and if you wanna learn about it, we're having a, another workshop in Costa Rica, you know, could think of worse places to visit uh, end of this year. So if you want, uh, we can talk about this. But most importantly, it's the, the people of the team, right? They, they do all the hard work, and I, I'm just here presenting their work, to be honest. So uh, I want to thank all these uh, people in my lab, and I want, would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. I'm also happy to take any questions now or later in the discussion. So, one quick question. Yeah. <coughs> Could you speak up a bit? I'm an old man, so. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of che checking everything, right? So each of these steps can be fully automated, right? But intermediate between these steps, I would check, right? So for instance, the signal drift, right? If you're saying like, oh, I'm going to do signal drift automatically, fully, you know, default settings. Well, if you only have one B0 image, it will not work, right? So then you need to define which B value. And obviously that part can also be scripted, but... You know, sometimes it's kind of complicated with which type of data you have and have the data been ordered or reordered in a different way. So each of these steps is fully automated. And the ones that I presented, like signal drift, uh, again, Gibbs ringing, optional, right? Because you may not have Gibbs ringing, then don't do it. Uh, if you don't have any signal drift, the good thing is applying the signal drift doesn't do anything harmful because then the, the actual drift will be the unity line, right? So that, that's fine. So I, I always do signal drift correction. Uh, because it also gives me information about percentage drift, etc. Um, and then, you know, there's always subject motion, especially nowadays, because our acquisitions with diffusion can tend to be uh, tend to be a bit longer, right? Because we acquire more data, especially in neuroimaging dedicated centers. Um, 
there's always a slight residual eddy currents because you know you can have the twice refocused uh, you know gradients, but you know there's always a bit of stretching going on or skews. Um, the EPI distortions, especially to go into higher field strength, they become more pronounced. So we also include that. Um, and then, you know, by default, use a robust estimator because if there's no outliers, well, it will estimate with all the data, and that's fine too. So th these are the, the typical steps that we do. And then, obviously, this is purely, you know, from a QA point of view, you know, topic of this session. But if you want to do analysis, sometimes you can further optimize your pre-processing the, in the context of your analysis. Like, hey, you know, um, go to some template space while doing correction for subject motion because you don't want to resample your data again and again and again because you get kind of smoothing effects, right? So ideally you want to concatenate all these transformation matrices together to go into one space, your final space, whatever. So, um, so there's a, unfortunately no free lunch in diffusion anyway. So you can also like press a button and here's my paper. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much.